I uh, wonder if you would consider anything for uh, criminal records, the people that have misdemeanor records uh, and they can't get housing. Apartments won't rent to them. Uh, they, they can't get housing because of their criminal record. I thought in this country when you paid your debt to society, your rights should be restored. But yet we continue to punish people and keep them in the system over and over and over. We will not give them an opportunity to rejoin society in any way. Now, I myself have no criminal record. I have no problem with that, but I've dealt with people. Okay? Thank you. Well, I'm on the Corrections Committee. We actually heard some bills like that last session. So you've got to balance a few things. But I agree with you on criminal justice reform. That's one of my other big questions for this session. Because if you really believe in conservative ideology and limited government, we want as few people in prison as possible, right? Because what happens when you put somebody in prison for two to three years? Now, they're not a productive member of society, so what does their family have to do? They have to rely on government to help get them through those two or three years where that grows government. And that person is taken out of the workforce, which makes it harder to reintegrate into the workforce after that three years, thereby being another drain on society. And not only that, that two or three years they've, stood, uh, they've been in prison, they pretty much had a master apprenticeship in crime, right? So once they can't get out and get a job to feed their family, they say the only thing I know how to do is get uh, go to crime, and it repeats the whole cycle. And then once you have kids in the home, 70% of uh, kids whose parents were in prison go to prison themselves. So you're right, if we can keep them from going to prison in the first place or figure out a way to reintegrate them into society and make them feel whole, uh, we need to take as many steps as we can for that. So I agree with that. The bill we had uh, in front of our committee was was more than just misdemeanors, it was felonies as well. And so you can't, I, I think apartment owners have to have some kind of say in who they rent their apartments to because there's liability on their end as well. So it's a, it's a delicate balance about reintegrating them into society and also protecting the, the apartment owner. But we do need to figure out something, maybe a nonviolent offender or somebody who has a misdemeanor. And you're right, we need to take away from the employment applications. If there's a uh, criminal pass, it doesn't, necessarily relate to what they're doing because that's a barrier again to them entering the workforce. So I, I completely agree with you and hopefully we take a lot of steps on criminal justice reform. Uh, that's a conservative issue. We stayed away from it for too long. And I, I agree with Matt. I just wanted to add that um, you know our jail, jails are filled with nonviolent offenders right now and if we want to be tough on crime uh, then we have to realize that um, we've got to get some of those guys out of there. We've got rapists and murderers and serious crimes where there's a victim who are getting off at half sentences to make room for the kid who got caught smoking a joint in grandma's basement by himself. Um, so yes, we, we need to get serious about a lot of that stuff. It's not something I want to touch on is something Representative Krauss talked about is that delicate balance. Uh, you have to remember the other side too, the people that own these properties or the people that are giving these jobs uh, we talk about free market all the time, and I think part of free market is that they're informed about the risk that they may be taking to rent to that person or that they may hire. So uh, if you see us down in Austin and it seems like we're talking out of both sides of our mouth, we're not. We have to balance both pieces. We really do with this issue because we have to balance doing what's right for those individuals, but we also have to protect the liberties and freedoms of the people that are going to offer those jobs or that are going to offer those places for rent for those people. And uh, I gotta be honest, I, the, the liberty piece, the freedom and the, the ch freedom of choice for these people to choose who they rent to is my first priority. My second priority would be to try to help these folks out that committed crimes um, to help them be able to find a place to rent, but that would be my, my second priority. Uh, hi, first of all, we all thank you and appreciate what you're doing for us, God bless every one of you. Mr. Stickland wisely mentioned about eliminating one of the magnets for the illegal immigrants or illegals here. So my question is, what can be done about sanctuary cities? You, you, could, you could ban them on a state level. You could defund any city that acts as a sanctuary city and acts a sanctuary city policy effectively acts as a sanctuary city, even if it's not an official policy. Uh, I think you're gonna actually see that pass. I think that is the most likely piece of immigration legislation to pass, mainly because it's targeted specifically at disobeying federal immigration detainer orders, which it, it's an easy sell. But I wanna caution you, don't settle for that alone. That, that I believe will pass, but 
you want to eliminate the magnets that more broadly apply to everybody in the general population of, of illegal aliens that might be present in Texas. That eliminating sanctuary cities isn't in itself a disincentive to immigrate here illegally. Uh, In-state tuition, removing job magnets, that is. So be happy about the sanctuary city bill that's likely to pass, but don't settle for that alone. We have a nearly two-thirds Republican majority in each house. Let me say this too. Uh, a lot of people don't realize this, but um, I think there's going to be an interesting discussion. Uh, Senator Burton has been talking a lot about this. Cities are a creation of the state. The state's also created the federal government. And I think we need to remember that, that these, these cities are not sovereign like the state of Texas is. And uh, we can remove their city charter at any time that we want to. Yeah, and, 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 on that, and on that point, you know, you hear people say, oh, the federal government, Texas is always against the federal government, say we want to do what we want to do, we want to do what we want to do. But then the Texas state legislature imposes on all these local governments and municipalities. You got to understand there's a different nature and relationship between the federal government, the state government, and state government, and cities, as Representative Stickland just said. Remember, the Constitution is a document of enumerated powers, which means if it doesn't say it in the Constitution, the federal government is not supposed to do it. Texas doesn't have that same issue with our Constitution. It's much more broadly based. It's much more free-flowing. So we have a lot more jurisdiction over a lot of different topics and, and things. So when anybody says, oh, you can't do this because you oppose what the federal government is doing to you, it's a much different scenario to apples and oranges. Good evening. Today's news revealed the new escalation of the anti-Trump demonstrations because today, for the first time, high school students walked out of their classes to join the protests. I believe that such protests are inspired by the public schools themselves, schools that indoctrinate our kids with their leftist ideology. Some believe that school choice will solve this problem, but four million kids, Texas kids, will be left behind in the public schools. If the legislature continues to allow leftists to, con to present biased public school curriculum, Texas will turn blue from the bottom up as these kids graduate. What can we do to fix this problem? Go to the school board elections. There are always low turnout. That would be your number one thing that I would tell you to do, is if you feel like you have school board members that are liberal, that are helping this liberal agenda, quit electing them. Go vote. Like you do in the primary, high number turnout. These guys shouldn't be getting elected with 3,000 votes across the whole city when there's a city of, say, three or 400,000. It shouldn't be happening. It's our own, a, a percentage of it is our own fault. We need to elect the people that we think will represent. Sir, school members. boards, though, follow the direction of TASA and TASB and, and give very little credence to the members of the community that they were elected to serve. That's why you can and you will listen to the uh, people in the district and go for lots of motions. You're right, it's cliche, but you're exactly right. I think we have to, uh, we're going to be, follow this is this is going to be a fun one. We're going to follow a bill to completely get rid of the STAR test and all standardized tests. Uh, I, think, I think we've got to return all the decisions back to the local level as much as possible. We've got to get away from the federal government. We've got to quit chasing those dollars that come with the strings attached. Common Core has gone out of Texas, but we see Common Core all across Texas with a different name and all kinds of stuff. So. Uh, we got to quit chasing the federal dollars, in my opinion. We've got to uh, get rid of the standardized testing, which is what teachers are forced to teach to, and you get a lot of that stuff coming down. And frankly, I think we got to make it easier to fire bad teachers. Yeah. 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 You know, it's interesting you just brought that up about we talk about our kids getting a Texas education. It shouldn't be a federal education. We need a Texas education, and I agree wholeheartedly with the fact that we need to get rid of these tests. You'd be surprised to know that there's a lot of Republican teachers out there that all they want to do is be professional educators and have quality outcomes for these students, and they don't want to follow this leftist agenda. I think you'd be really surprised at how many Republican teachers are out there. This is another 
education question, but from a different point of view. And the one good thing that the task, STAR test did was point out that in 2016, only 58% of at-risk readers passed the test. And in 2015, the last time we had numbers from the PAINS reporting system, only 4% of 70% of school districts, 300, um, 800 of the 1,200 reporting districts, reported that they had dyslexic students. We have dyslexia laws in Texas. These students should be receiving evidence-based instruction, but they're not because there's no enforcement of this dyslexia handbook. Are any of you familiar with the handbook? And what would you say to this mother who wants my children and other people's children to learn to read? I have a grandson who has dyslexia. I know exactly what you're talking about. There also is not a program in Texas for those that have dysgraphia. It's part of a related it's, You're exactly it's related. right. It's on the and we can do a lot better for those students. Uh, I actually had a conversation with our new commissioner on that very topic because of the difficulties that my grandson had. Who is that commissioner? Mike Moore. Oh, I know who that is. <laughs> this last selection showed us that we're tired of the uh, play along to get along and I'm going to make my question quick and easy and I expect an answer from everyone. We have a lot of people with political aspirations that have run on the immigration. Our country and our state is invaded, invaded by foreign people. And these people, once they got what they wanted, well, they washed out. So I'm here to ask you, are you going to text them up? and keep going with it, or as soon as it becomes difficult, will you, you know, start to say we should spend money on the children and everything else? Well, for, I, I, okay. for starters, we spent over $800 million this last session of money that we shouldn't have to spend because the, the federal government needs to settle up and do their doggone job. Right. Right? You guys agree? Yes. Yeah. So, first and foremost, the federal government needs to do it, but in their absence, the Texas legislature stepped into the gap and spent $800 million and will continue to try to stop illegal immigration every single session until it stops. And we're going to do it from 10 different directions, which I know Matt's probably going to talk about a few of them. Um, but we have to stop the things that we've already talked about. We've got to stop sanctuary cities. We've got to stop them from getting any kind of benefits. Look, they go to your schools for free. They go to these schools and then they're taught Spanish, they're, they're taught in Spanish because they don't know English. They're going to your hospitals. I think our budget's what, 37% health and human services and another 35% education? Huge swaths of that are going to these people and we need to stop them. So my answer is yes, I will continue to fight every like single yes. session until it's fixed. Next. Yeah, I was gonna, well I was gonna say, uh, we are fighting hard, and we're we're always fighting hard. It's 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 a little harder in the House when uh, you know House leadership doesn't want to be controversial. Uh, and I put that in quotes. Uh, and that's a controversial topic to them, so it's very difficult to bring it up. But we'll sound the trumpet. Everyone up on this stage has uh, basically been as loud as we possibly can be that this is unacceptable. That this doesn't get brought up, and it's in poll after poll the number one issue for Texans. Like not even close, like 40% the number one issue. Uh, under 10% is the next highest issue, poll after poll after poll. So what can we do on the state level? We can eliminate sanctuary cities. We can eliminate magnets that bring illegal immigrants to the country, in-state tuition, jobs, um, uh, benefits to the extent that the federal government and the courts don't uh, overturn our bills, uh, which is why we're being very careful in how we draft them. Luckily, we have a federal government who seems ready to assist us, an incoming federal government that, that at least campaigned on the promise of assisting us on this. So I look forward to uh, the federal government as well, either removing benefits or allowing us to remove benefits further from illegals currently in the country. So hopefully with that new partnership, maybe we can make some progress that we haven't had in the past. But we still need your help fighting through the House. They're gonna try hard to kill all these bills. Yeah. 
I think uh, if that bill gets to the floor, it's going to pass. But one of the things that uh, I've complained about now for some time is uh, we allow a locally elected official who happens to be a committee chair or even the Speaker of the House to have uh, the power of life and death over any legislation that gets to the floor. And one of the things that I've supported is a change in the House rules so that if you get 76 co-authors on a bill, that bill must come to the floor. And you, you know, I, th I think that uh, obviously if we would get uh, leadership that was predisposed towards listening to the will of the people as opposed to, uh, as opposed to placating uh, the Democrats, that would also go a long way towards uh, making sure that legislation like this got to the floor. So, in my first election against Todd Smith, I knocked on 7,112 doors, and I think every single one of them, I told them that the, one of the reasons I was running was because Todd Smith voted for in-state college tuition for illegals. I have promised every single person in my district since I got started that I will follow that bill until we're done. And that was reaffirmed to me last session when they had a parade against me <laughs> in Austin and came in and sat in our Texas Capitol with uh, Mexican flags inside our Texas Capitol. I will not stop. This, this is, this is going to happen for me. And I just want to... I just want to reiterate, though, the, prob the biggest problem with illegal immigration is that we have a welfare state, okay? And they're taking from us to give to them. That's the biggest problem. And it's not just in-state college tuition, it's not just free food stamps or welfare or whatever. It's the fact that they're not paying their fair share on water infrastructure, on our roads, on anything. Um, so, you know, we, people have asked me, you know, why is it so bad? Some of these line items aren't that much money. We do not have a real number on the cost of illegal immigration. We cannot even figure out how much we have lost in, you know, just an unfair playing field between those of us who have to pay taxes and those of them that don't. And send it back in cash. So it's just, yes, I'm doing it. Thank you. Everybody on this stage voted for the $800 million in spending last session. And even though we've elected a new president, it will be a while before reinforcements come at the federal level. Uh, but I do believe they will. Don't wait on them. Well, we're not waiting on them. $800 million is a substantial amount of money that's been put in border security more than any other state, by the way, even though they're along the border, has invested. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't know what else I can say uh, that hasn't already been said, but I completely agree. I mean, hopefully the federal government will ease that burden a little bit on what we're doing. And so I think once the federal government shows that it's serious about border security and taking this uh, issue seriously, then that will help on a lot of the collateral issues that are going along with it as well. But until they step in and actually do their job, I think every single one of us up here and most of the people in Texas are committed to seeing it through to make sure we continue to protect our citizens. Uh, from anything that might happen. I also think we have a case to make for reimbursement from the federal government for the money that the state has been forced to spend. Yeah. I mean, I also tell you uh, to write your congressman, and the reason I tell you to write your congressman is they, they're sending 150 border patrol agents to the border. They need to know that you're happy with that yeah. so that they continue to do it because they just did it this week. Yeah. I wanted to ask, in recent years, public universities here in Texas, like the University of Texas at Austin, have just become openly hostile to the Republican Party and conservative ideas in many of their social classes, you know, like government and history. As these universities are funded by the taxpayers, can the legislature, the taxpayers representatives, do anything like, for example, passing a law allowing the governor to appoint the chancellor of the president of these universities, maybe limiting tenure for the professors at these universities, yeah. maybe even requiring that certain things be emphasized in the curriculum. Like the second of the U.S. Constitution gives you the right to fire, and an instructor cannot say it doesn't give you that, et cetera, et cetera. I think the 
budget debate over university funding is going to take an interesting turn this, <laughs> this, this upcoming session, I can imagine. Yeah, universities have now become tools to socialize our youth and not educate them. That can't be allowed to persist, especially while we're funding them. Yeah, I, I've looked at some various things, and like for instance, I said, you know what, they always are concerned about diversity. They want diversity of color, where you come from, or whatever, but they don't care about diversity of philosophical viewpoint. In fact, they try and stifle it. Uh, so I, I think that what I'm trying to find is a piece of legislation that we could pass that would deal with it, that would in essence have a, uh, uh, you know, have a real good message to it so that, uh, you know, it would, uh, uh, they could turn and, and, and use it against us, but uh, there's no doubt about it. Uh, so often, uh, they, they're pushing everything to the left, and yet, uh, when we try and have something that uh, puts a little common sense to it, uh, we're fought, uh, you know, they, they try and fight back. Let me tell you something. We are pouring a whole lot of money into these uh, institutions of higher learning, and without a doubt, we're training them to be un-American. So uh, I, I think uh, trying to find the right piece of legislation to do it, and uh, then get it, of course, through the House and the legislature. With the success of private universities, I think it's fair fair time for us to start with answering the question whether we should even have public universities, to be honest with you. I'll tell you, we've done a couple of things. and I do something at the grassroots level. It helps, it doesn't cure it. I go to UTA and I have a relationship with Dr. Carbari. I go and I teach these political science classes with Dr. Sachs. I just did one with Shannon, what was it, last week or the week before? We go out and we teach the way that we want them to know versus the way that they're, they're teaching them. Another thing that we did, and we're getting ready to do potentially with TCU. You guys, a couple months ago, I remember uh, in Houston, the young lady that got in trouble for First Amendment uh, speech and they were going to remove her from college and make her do all these uh, diversity classes. Raise your hand if you kind of remember that. Well, a lot of people don't know that I wrote a letter to her using my state rep letterhead and I told her, remember who holds your freaking purse strings, lady. You better fix this. And I don't know that our letter did anything, but on Monday morning, that, that student council organization reversed what they did. We need to be involved. We need to fight them the way that we fight on the House floor. You need to force your legislators to be involved in these campuses. I'm not saying right here, we're all pretty involved, but we need it across the state. We need people calling and writing letters. It's happening in Texas Christian right now, and we're on the verge of trying to see if we can get some other legislators to get involved and stop this horrible leftist agenda at the college campuses. Right, and, and if you need any proof of what can happen when citizens get involved, just look at Stanford Fort Worth and what they did in Fort Worth ISD. I mean, you can replicate that at the college level just as much as you can at the secondary school level. And all that was, I mean, you had everybody lined up in support in favor of what was going on at Fort Worth ISD, everything that they needed for cover. But it wasn't until the people got involved and the citizens got involved and created a movement, created an outcry and a backlash that Fort Worth ISD finally uh, stepped back. So, uh, I mean, again, it sounds cliche, but you're exactly right. When you get involved, activated, engaged, things happen. Thank you for being here. We appreciate it. I would like to know the status of the Texas State Medicaid reimbursement rate cuts and where's that at? in the legislature right now, and is there going to be an announcement about that across the state of Texas when it's finally decided? I guess what I'm asking is when will it be decided? Are you, are you speaking about the therapy rate cuts that were done? Yes. So mm -hmm. for, for special needs children? Medic, yeah, yeah. Right. Uh, as I understand it, they are still pushing forward, the agency is on that. Uh, but I think that the legislature will have a little more to say about that once we're in session. Do you have any idea about when, time frame wise? That well, that, that would be part of the budget 
Okay. And one of the reasons why that was made so uh, made worse is it was compounded by the fact that we were then not able to pull down federal matching funds. And so that cut was bigger. It, there were a lot of unintended consequences. Uh, it was based on a study that indicated that we paid higher therapy rates in Texas than other states. What you need to know is that was a flawed study. And we based a decision, you know, that it had been true. That would have been the right thing to do if we paid substantially more than other states. But as it turns out, it's not true. And the way that that writer was written had many unintended consequences. The dollar amount was actually greater than what was originally intended. So it'll probably be during the budget process. And, and there's two cuts going on right now, right? The Medicaid therapy cuts, which you're talking about, and then the ones to the fragile kids in that study. The is that different? The ones to the fragile kids is rolling them into Medicaid managed care. Right. And you're talking about the therapy cuts, not the managed care? Well, it just, I believe, if I'm correct, it just just recently rolled over into managed care. Is that correct? The, there, there is a population, the Star Kids program, uh, that they just rolled into managed care. Right. They were trying to get a 12 month delay on rolling that in, but I don't think anybody uh, approved that. So yeah, I think that one's kind of done, unfortunately. Same with right. the cuts. So. Right. So in terms of implementation or timeline for implementation, what are we looking at? Do you know? Right now, we're still operating under the budget from that was approved two years ago. Going forward, we will approve a budget for the next two years during legislative session. So we'll have to go you know, through the appropriations process. There could be an emergency supplemental. There could will be. likely be an emergency supplemental because we do have cost overruns. If it's the, the you're right, the quickest that could be addressed is through that supplemental. Right, right, okay. Thank you. It would help us if you have specific questions for each one of us, or all of us. Oh, I can do that. Okay. I have several. Okay, um, I want to know, because I've only heard, I believe, one person talk about something about family. Okay, don't get me wrong there. I want to know how many of you know how much Social Security from all of us is coming out of our Social Security going to Title IV DNE and giving incentives for the judges in the family court to take our children away. I haven't seen my twins in 607 days today that were taken to the DFW airport by a PTA mother from Birdville. They were ninth graders. They're now juniors. I haven't seen them or heard from them. I haven't seen my other two children in 315 days. So the incentive is there for the appropriations committee at the top to give to each state their appropriations committee, and the incentives are to remove mostly mothers in custody modifications, and each child is worth a certain amount of money. I don't know what it is but it's to keep the fighting going in the courts. So far, I have spent in a year, six hundred, I'm sorry, $65,000. Question. Hold on. So have I have, they want to know. No, no. Okay. They said 20 seconds for the beginning. You know what, you cut me off at another meeting. You're not going to do it. You're I want to know who is going to uh, help to fund this Title IV DNE. Which one of you? Any of you? Are, are any of you in the Judicial Committee to help us? Not one? How long would you go without your children? Yeah, it'd, it'd be devastating. Unfortunately, I don't know enough to speak on that. Well, there was over 500 Facebook groups regarding parental alienation. And there's millions of us out here. And everyone here looking at me now thinks, that woman must have done drugs, because that's the stigmatism. I've never done a drug or a crime. I have over 1,800 parents in my Facebook groups that are not seeing their children, and two of them committed suicide last month. 
So we need to get some help out here. Well, I can't speak to your specific situation because I, I don't know, but we released a very large in-depth CPS study today, uh, my office did, in regards to um, fixing the CPS problem and uh, specifically on parental rights and liberties through the process, which have been trampled in many different cases uh, through CPS. So um, I, I think it will be an agenda item that people take seriously. But and this is a well, this I, isn't CPS related. You understand? CPS also gets um, funding, incentives for CPS to go out and kidnap our children. From the federal this government. Is, yes, this is. Okay, we don't have jurisdiction over that title funding that you're talking about. So there's nothing that we could do anyways. Our hands are tied at the state level through CPS. So that's why I'm trying to answer your question from what we can feasibly do. And I will tell you that. Many of us definitely uh, been working on CPS reform in the next session. I released a very extensive document that I would encourage you to go look at uh, literally this afternoon. Yeah, what I would suggest is, you know, a lot of times it's hard in an environment like this to, uh, to dig down deep as to exactly some of the issues and stuff like that. What I would recommend is going directly, uh, if you have that many people where this is that kind of problem, everybody needs to go to their state representatives, their state senators, and sit down and kind of go over it with them. And uh, because, I mean, unfortunately, one of the things that happens down there is we almost have to be a, uh, a jack of all trades, master of none. I know a lot about health care, but when it starts to, uh, trying to dive into some of these specific uh, nuances of the budget and stuff like that, it's very difficult to do. So the only thing that can be done is, I, I, I spent an hour with uh, uh, a woman today whose uh, uh, kids had been taken uh, and it was kind of a, gone through a family court and all this other stuff and there were some problems. But it's, it's entirely different from what you're talking about. So uh, obviously there's a lot of issues out there but the only way can they, they can really be dealt with is for us to fully understand exactly what's happening. And the way to do that is to get a short, uh, nothing more than about a page to explain the problem and then to a solution. I've already wrote that out for the Iowa legislators because that's where I'm from. And I've met with Michelle Bachman, Steve Forbes, Pence, and all of them. And Ben Carson, I gave 41 stories that I got in 30 minutes from other parents going through this. And if anyone cares to do anything here about this, uh, Pastor Robert Morris in South Lake is now on Trump's Spiritual Advisory Committee. So I'm going to him with probably several thousand of other stories. Trump. One of the things that you need to consider is unless we're on those committees that are doing those particular issues we were unaware that there's there's a problem and well, when this happens and like myself i lose sixty-five thousand to the courts and i haven't seen a courtroom yet can you believe that i haven't seen a courtroom because i have two lawyers that have quit because they get you to the end and then they quit well the only one's winning unless it's going pro se but what happens if you take all of us away from our children and we keep us in here, here's what my point. I would, take us away, what's going to happen in the economy? We're I would, going to be spending money there. I would encourage you to sit down with some documentation with the members that are up here, you know, in a you know, in a more private meeting, uh, because obviously there's an issue that we're not aware of. And I, I would also recommend, I'm going to bring this to their attention. I'm going to be down in Austin tomorrow I'm meeting with CPS director, but I'm also going to swing by Texans for lawsuit reform. reform. I'm going to drop this off to them and, uh, and have them look into it, because this is the type of stuff that, that they like to, to tackle. So yeah, many of us are filing federal court claims over this, and we're going against the states and everything now. It's our only option. I'm sorry this is happening to you, and I'll bring this to them tomorrow night. How about the Cowboys? Amen. Yeah. How about that? Woo. Bill touched on this problem a bit while ago, but uh, my question is, uh, when, what are our chances of getting a new Speaker of the House? <laughs> <laughs> a real conservative Republican. 
And if we don't, what do we do? Keep praying. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, my guess would be on uh, the first day of session, Joe Strauss will be elected speaker. I mean, I, I, I think that is, I, maybe somebody up here disagrees with me, I think that's almost a near certainty at this point. And so what do we do? I think you have to stay stronger and be more persistent about what your voice is. Uh, because I think when you stay together in numbers, uh, the Texas Conservative Coalition now has over 50, 60 members. If they all get together and stay as a block, that's pretty formidable. Uh, I think you have to strategize. You have to be a little more together and unified in the, move, uh, in the direction you're going. So I don't think we're going to see a different speaker for this session, but that doesn't mean we still can't be effective as conservatives and get conservative policies. Because you got to remember the Senate is pretty co committed to passing a lot of conservative policies. And if they keep throwing things over and throwing things over, it's going to be hard to ignore that time and time and time again. So you just have to be unified, have to be organized, ready to move on those bills when they come over. But uh, again, I think it's almost a near certainty that uh, Joe Strauss will be speaker for a fifth term. Somebody can disagree with me if they want to. Hi, I would like to know what each one of y'all will do in this great state of Texas to help the veterans who come home from the wars with PTSD, specifically with our police departments, by educating them. Put the bug in your ear now. Please research PTSD. Innocent men who fight for our great country are being harassed by the police department. Um, I know I can't give a speech, but I would like to know what y'all can do to help the veterans. One of the things that I'm working on for next session, and it, it, it's not just for veterans, but it's for anyone that may have a mental health condition, a medical condition like diabetes, or even uh, the, the people that brought this to me were some parents that had kids that had autism that are high functioning, they go to work, they go to school, they drive. And that is where the car tags voluntarily can be tagged as can their license so that if they're stopped, that they approach them differently than they might another citizen. It's voluntary. You can refuse to do it, but a number of those families that have loved ones with autism and some mental illness have asked me to file that. I, I did 21 years in the military. I'm a combat veteran. Um, I was a commander of soldiers that have PTSD. It's real, it exists. I know that people have, have in the audience probably know that it, it's real. Um, i tell you that, I'm, I'm happy to tell you that there are a lot of sheriff's departments and police departments across the state that are, are doing some things that uh, are very successful when it comes to not just uh, military veterans, they're called CIT units and they specialize in people with mental health issues. And those counties are Bear County, Williamson County, I think Tarrant County is going to lead on them too. Um, and what they do is absolutely amazing. They, they, when they're not dealing with an emergency call, they're going around and touching those people and saying, hey Johnny, how are you doing? Are you taking your medicine? Is there anything I can do for you? They're helping them build relationships with them. And I think that that community-based involvement at the city and county level is going to be really important. So I'm going to encourage other departments around the state to continue to do those types of programs versus the state mandating something. Um, because I think those are the programs that work. They are working, and I think they will continue to work better if we can keep replicating success. Hello, everyone. Mine's more of an invitation than a question. And my name is Steve Belcher. I'm with the Texas Vaping Network. I don't know if you guys know what vaping is. I got to meet some of these gentlemen at the uh, Texas Right to Life event banquet on um, Friday, I believe it was. Wonderful cause. Side note: If it wasn't for if it wasn't for two of my kiddos' parents that's choosing not to be able to not abort their kids. I would not have a Marine and a, a young lady who just got accepted a UTA's nursing program. That's a side note. My invitation is, there is a, a movie coming out December the 8th at Rave Motion Pictures. It's called A Billion Lives. It is a worldwide successful documentary. It's won many awards. My invitation to you 
is if you would, you or your district directors would attend the movie to see for yourself the, the manipulation that is happening in our national government in regards to electronic cigarettes. Um, the, you. Ticket, the tickets are free. And as a matter of fact, there will be 100 tickets that will be free. If anybody wants to go, I have some business cards. I didn't come prepared for this. I wasn't wanting to speak, but I'm going to now. Um, I appreciate everybody here. You guys have done some wonderful work. I've gotten to know a couple of you in, com in casual conversations, as well as Mr. Rinaldi, and a couple of visits. And I appreciate it. You guys were on, on your issue, I'll just say, you know, being a Liberty guy and a, a Liberty lover, I, I think people should be able to make up their own minds what they want to do to themselves, so long as they um, don't infringe on someone else's liberty. So exactly. I've gotten in a lot of trouble for uh, fighting for freedom for electronic cigarettes in the past in the last campaign, but I, I believe that you're smarter than the people in Austin, so you need to make well, up your own mind. Uh, guys, if you just, if there's seriously, if you want to come and have your eyes open, it's Thank a 90-minute movie at rate. And Representative Stickland and I last session fought really hard for freedom <laughs> to <laughs> do what you want to do uh, with your with, with your electronic cigarettes, smoking, anything like that. Uh, what's interesting is it became an a anti-competitive lobby target. A lot of the anti-electronic uh, cigarette legislation was actually being pushed by who certified vaping tobacco companies. And what happened was they invested a lot of money in their own electronic cigarettes instead of the vapor products, and those didn't take off. So now they want to put the vapor products out of business so they'll, eat, so they'll buy their own products. So again, lobbies, crony capitalism, that's what the, the crux of all these bills are. And that's why you had such an effort last session. But always, it's always for the children. That's, that's <laughs> right. Yeah, one, one last question. This has nothing to do with this. This thing is such a wonderful insight. I would love to if you pay for this event's rental today. Okay, we're going to move on because you actually yeah, didn't even okay. ask a question the first time. Okay. I think you just offered to pay for the next round. I'm, pay for, I'm <laughs> offering to pay uh, for the... Give them the microphone. We cannot be bought. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, think, I think he's offering to pay for the rental facility for the month. If I'm not. I get that, but he still doesn't get the mic. Next question. Well, we'll take it 600, I think, is what it is. Yes. My question has to do with toll roads. What are y'all planning to do to take care of that? They're planning to toll almost every road in Dallas and in Fort Worth. And uh, right now, I'm in Irving. They're working on 183, putting in, doing all this construction. It's supposed to be for us. And yet, all they're doing is adding toll lanes. They're not even adding any extra free lanes, is my understanding. So we're putting up with all this nonsense, and then we're going to have to pay to drive on the roads. So. I, I think we yeah, got to get rid of them. I think we need to be leery of public-private partnerships that never end up working out for the public, but the private instead. I'm actually filing a bill on toll roads. It's a little bit different. Uh, my Bedford Fire Department brought this to us, and it turns out that um, if you get into a wreck on the freeway, and an emergency service comes out there and performs a service, then TxDOT reimburses to the city for the cleanup and some of the stuff that they did. Um, but a toll road company is exempt, is exempt from that. So Bedford currently, for instance, is having to go answer 911 calls on the toll roads and completely eat all of it. Um, and because of the toll roads and where you can get on, Bedford is actually servicing Euless, Bedford, Hearst, and parts of North Richland Hills at a complete loss for the cities. So one of the things that we're going to be doing is filing a bill that allows um, emergency service providers the ability to get money back from the toll roads. Because right now, we're just paying for them and, and they're getting all the profit, <laughs> frankly. Yeah, and I think uh, Texans all over the state feel the same way you do. They're toll weary, right? And so I think there's a huge move. I, I would guess out of this next session, you're going to see a big movement not to have any more toll roads for a while. Now, that doesn't stop the ones already going into place, the ones already under contract, but I think a lot of Texans feel the same way you do. We hear that all the time, stop the toll, stop the toll, stop the toll. So I think there will be some movement on it, maybe not as quick as you'd like it to, but I think there will be some progress. In the 
uh, transportation constitutional amendment that we passed, one of the things that we did was limit where those dollars could not be used. Yeah, but they're, it's, not, it's not been effective because they're they're going around it in other ways. And from what I've seen, it's in Austin there. I believe some Austin of those roads may have already been under contract prior to that. But going forward, those dollars cannot be used for toll roads. But I think state dollars can, however. So it's coming from other state dollars and not specifically those. I, we had a, we had a, uh, a bill that actually prioritized the funding priorities for transportation. I think it was 20, I'm not sure. Um, and I remember a couple of us had anti-toll amendments that got roundly defeated, merely saying that, merely saying that uh, free roads would be prioritized over toll roads for state funding if the state was funding part of the project, and that didn't pass. However, we do have a, a a transportation chair in the house at least that's that, that's against toll roads so i'm optimistic i think what i read today um, was that they're taking that money and they're spending the money that they're required to spend on roads that aren't really a problem and then they're still putting tolls on the roads where there is a lot of congestion it's something that they're they're finding a way around it is, you can is make what it I'm really easy to get rid of them if you just said the state no can't more. enter a contract that's for 50 or 100 years. I shouldn't be able to sign away my kid's debt for 100 years down the road. That's why they're doing it, because of the, the way the contracts are written. But anyways, yes, I think we all know. Thank you. My name is Jeff, <coughs> Jeff Morgan, and um, I'm here about the CPS issue. Jonathan, I read a little bit of your article today. It looks good. I'd like to talk with you more later on. Stephanie, thank you so much for inviting me to Austin in July. Um, CPS issues. We've talked about children that have been killed, but one of the things that we don't talk about is families that have been victimized by CPS because of false allegations. And when CPS chooses not to uh, not to be involved and they have knowledge of everything that's going on, I was one such person. I haven't seen my grandchildren now for a year and a half. I had to spend eighteen thousand dollars in court fees because of false allegations. And here is my transcript of the court and also from the court and also evidence of my innocence. And I was declared innocent. Um, so I hope you guys really take this to heart. You just can't give money without reformation. That's like giving a drunk money without getting him cleaned up first. But the issue that I really want to ask you about as well, the Attorney General has on his website the importance of grandparents in the lives of their grandchildren. Yet Texas does not have anything like grandparents' rights. In fact, there are other states such as Michigan, Alabama, and Georgia that have passed them. And what I want to know is what will you do as far as helping grandparents be involved in their grandchildren's lives? Because even as the Attorney General says, it's a very important role that we have to play in their lives. I'll start off. Tell you. I'm going down to Austin tomorrow to meet with the new director of CPS, who's a retired law enforcement officer who has a 10-point plan that on paper it looks good, but I want to see the lights of his eyes and talk to him and, and believe the plan he has. Um, we have a lot of issues, and I think one of the biggest issues that we found through the committee hearings is that we have horrible, high, horribly high turnover, about 60% in the first six months of CPS, which causes there's, there's no good reason for a child to ever be harmed. But I think that CPS's poor decision making oftentimes comes from a lack of um, experience and lack of not knowing what the right thing is to do due to turnover. So that's one of the things we're gonna have to address this, thing, this, this next session, and it will be addressed. It's been a pretty hot topic across the board, and you have a few members here who are on that committee. So, right. um, grandparents' rights. I'm going to be perfectly honest and tell you I didn't know a whole lot about that, but if you bring that to us, we'd be glad to look at it and see if it's something that we can't assist with. Thank you. Well, from what I've heard proposed, Stephanie might be able to talk to this better, but I've heard that there's a movement to kind of bifurcate the uh, social services uh, process. Right now you've got social workers doing the investigation, doing some of the determination on the legal status and things. 
So what we might want to go to is law enforcement taking that first stage of the CPS process, because they're better equipped to know if, if the child needs to leave your uh, presence, if they need to be taken away, or how long they need to be taken away. They're trained, they're educated more on that. So then after the law enforcement piece has done its job, and the social services piece comes in, and they get to handle what they're doing. Right now, social services is handling both of those. So I think that could cut down on a lot. Hopefully that um, unfair taking away of the children by having the law enforcement do that. As far as grandparents' rights, that's another one I've, uh, I sympathize with. We've had grandparents in our office talking about this, and, and it's tough. There's some horrible situations. Again, it's a delicate balance for me. I think the parents have the ultimate right to raise their kids, and sometimes when you have these grandparents in, in uh, conflict with the parents, I tend to err and go on to the side of the parents. They, they may not be making good decisions, they may not be doing the best things for the child, but they're their parents, and so I think uh, that's where that uh, conflict comes in, you've got to be very sensitive to that. So um, I know it's very real, I know it's a struggle, and I can't uh, imagine the situation that you're in. I don't know if the best public policy is to take rights and authority away from the parents to make some of those decisions. So that that's where I'm on that. We might have, look, we might have our first disagreement of the night. Um, I'm very cautious about the militarization of CPS. Um, I'm very nervous about adding a law enforcement element to the front of a CPS investigation. I understand what he's talking about. I know Matt's not taking a firm stance on it, and the devil's in the details. <laughs> However, um, the last thing I want to do is militarize CPS. I do not want any caseworker to walk into a situation with a predetermined idea of what this person may or may not be like that a law, from a law enforcement standpoint. So for me, um, listen, um, a lot of these problems are just difficult to deal with. And the real answer is for us to all self-govern just a little bit better, frankly. And the churches get involved in these things. CPS and social work and all that stuff is just so nasty. And when you really dive into it, it is depressing. We hear horror stories everywhere. It's the human element. Sin is in the world. And yep. the government is not going to fix this problem. Can I address the church issue real briefly? I'm, I'm not going to take time here. I have been a missionary. I've Why don't we do this? Why don't we set up a meeting? Okay. Okay, because Glad there's it. a lot of people in line right. and we're running out of time. And also, uh, regarding Roy Whitman, he did tell me he was going to come contact me back. This was on July the 12th. He has yet to do so. It wasn't until I got a hold of Senator Van Taylor that I actually got some response from CPS. This has been a long time coming. So Roy has not, in my opinion, kept his end of the bargain with the t-shirt. My opinion. I'm back, Kathy Hadley. Um, my question is, what can y'all do about the Robin Hood plan? Talking about a devil in the deal, there he is. And that I've, I've, I've taught in some very poor school districts, and I've taught in some very wealthy school districts. The poor districts, they didn't benefit from any money. I think somebody's pocket did. Okay. My opinion. Yes, we've got a, just so, what can y'all do for the Robin Hood? Told you there's Republican <laughs> teachers. <laughs> I filed a bill today, uh, the first day bill filing period, that would eliminate Robin Hood in the state of Texas. Um, the, the interesting thing is, last session was the first bill I filed last session, too. And when I first went into research, I thought, how are we going to? How are we going to replace this money? How are we going to ensure that poorer school districts aren't disproportionately affected by it? And I was shocked to see how little money in the aggregate scheme of things is actually redistributed. I mean, it's really around, when I looked at it, I think it's more now, but it was actually around $2 billion or something like that, which is a lot of money, but the total education budget is 50, 60, something like that. Uh, we actually increased the education budget in last, uh, session by enrollment growth plus 1.5 billion dollars. That was just one session increase in the education budget. We were talking about two billion dollars in redistribution. So that's something you could eliminate in one session of budget growth. I mean, it's not it, it's not undoable. The reason why they don't do it is because it isn't intended to actually help poorer school districts. It's intended for people in richer school districts to pay more taxes. It's, it's an equality thing, and it's designed so that Dallas ISD doesn't pay 1.5% while Colleyville 
uh, or you know, South Lake pays a half percent in taxes. So it's designed to punish you. It doesn't help the school districts, and it needs to go. Thank you. Uh, one of the items that was a legislative priority uh, was property tax reform with no income tax. I was wondering if any of you are working on that or if you know of any good bills that are, have to deal with that. I know Paul Bettencourt over in the Senate is working on a, a property tax relief package. And uh, again, last session we kind of threw money at the problem, which government tries to do sometimes. If I ask anybody in here, raise your hand if you felt a lot of property tax relief when you wrote that check this year. We raise your hand. Nobody, right? So we can't just throw the money at it. I think it's going to come with more structural reforms on the appraisal board and how we go about rolling back. Uh, those uh, rates, when they hit a certain level, it shouldn't. The burden shouldn't be on the people to roll back the tax rates. The burden should be on the government to justify why they have to give more taxes. And so, I think structural reform with appraisal boards and uh, those roll back elections. I think those are two of the key ways we're going to look at some property tax relief that's actually structural and not just throwing money at it. It's always about the children. Both Governor Abbott and Dan Patrick have been very vocal that this legislation is going to work on education funding. Mr. Rinaldi indicated he's looking at it, or any of the rest of you, looking at constitutional educational budgeting. And um, if ESAs were to come into being, how do you really feel about moving taxpayer dollars that do not equal private school education into private hands without accountability. Well, first of all, I don't, I don't know which part of the question to deal with first, but I, I think we're all going to deal with education and funding because it's one of the biggest budgetary issues we have. As far as ESAs, and I disagree with the premise and the way you put it. it it's, Listen, we, we all pay property taxes throughout our entire life, um, and th those of us who, who are blessed enough to have children are going to send our kids to school for a certain amount of time. Therefore, we are going to be spending $12,000 per student or whatever it happens to be over the course of that child's education, right? Per year. Per, per year. Per, yeah, per year. That's what I mean. $12,000 $12, per student per year. So what, what the ESAs do is it takes a portion of that money it allows you to choose where it goes. It's not going somewhere with no accountability because the first level of accountability is it has to actually go towards tuition or educational products. The second layer of accountability is we proceed with the assumption, and we have to proceed with this assumption, that the parent wants a good education for their student because otherwise everything breaks down if we don't go with that assumption. So assuming that, competition is the accountability system. Like it is in every other industry, in the entire state of Texas. The restaurant industry doesn't need an accountability system, even though some of them are really bad, because the really bad restaurants we don't give our money to. So that's what we're saying. In the end, the, the thing with the ESAs in competition is, currently our accountability system is the state government goes in, they test your children, they decide what grades you need on those tests. In this new system, the accountability system is parents who want the best for their children won't give money to schools that don't teach their children in, in, in a proper way. So we look at the breakup of the big Bella companies. What happens to the industry? Can I ask real quick? $5,500 versus that $28,000 tuition at Shelton School. Mm -hmm. How many parents can, can use that $5,800 and offset enough of the Shelton education to provide education for their child? But in the public school, if that had been left there, whether the child is there or not, it just feels like public taxpayer dollars are being pulled out. And education costs are not instruction. They're the entire cost. The public school is making out better because the per student spending at the public school is going up because they're not taking the entire $12,000 per student. No, they're so actually, it increases. The, when, it, when a student decides not to go to the school and they move to another school district, let's say they move to Colorado and their parents take them away. I've heard this story. I've seen right. four chairs. A absolutely. But, but what I'm saying is the public school district doesn't get that funding. In the case of ESAs, they still keep some of the funding. They keep some so of it. So it's increasing. But 
But my now, taxpayer what? was $12,000. That's what I put into the zip code, whether my children attend or not. So you're saying if I take out my No, not necessarily. You don't put it into the zip code. I don't. Because the way the public school formulas go, what, the, what your zip code gets is dependent on whether or not your child attends public school. So the school funding formulas aren't as easy as your local tax money and that's stays why I'm there. Asking you. But that, I mean, that, that's why what the ESAs do is they inject competition into the process. That, I mean, that's the main difference. So you competition believe, instead of the government. Bill. Okay. So you believe that a fixed price per student will will regulate competition throughout the system? No. no. Because we always have will regulate system. Yeah. Choice does. And, and I think there was a study that showed if you average out all the private schools in Texas, the average tuition is like $4,800, $4,900 or something like that. It's so now you're not going to a Fort Worth country day, going to those places. So I, I can see where that can help. And it's up to each individual parent if you want to take the $5,500 and put it for its $28,000 tuition. Um, but I, I guess, as Representative Rinaldi said, I kind of uh, refute the premise that it's going back to private hands. The only reason the state has money in the first place is because private taxpayers are giving them the money. So like, it's not that it's, I mean, it's, it, it, it's their money in the first place. It's okay if they want to use it for a different purpose. I, I do think you can look back at San Antonio. They had a, a Horizon Scholarship pilot program for 10 years, and they went into Edgewood ISD. It was a very uh, low I serving, think Lisa Owens from town. Edgewood. It's a lovely town. You're right. Yeah, for students so, who it requires more money. But, it, the but here's the thing with that pilot program. They took the students, it was privately funded. They found that all the students who went to private school ended up testing better. The kids who stayed in public school actually tested better and got a better education because it forced those public school districts to innovate and do better so that they could keep those students and educate them better. So that's just one little anecdote. That's just one little uh, closed circuit. Uh, snapshot that could be replicated throughout the whole state. Yeah, but we also don't know what the bill says yet. If there's parts of it that allow the government to intrude into private or home schools, that's something I would not I be in favor of. I just want to know if kids are going to have to be given evidence-based instruction. That's that's the whole thing. Is 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 yeah, there? Yeah, but who's evidence-based? I mean, who's evidence-based? Yeah. The experts in the field. So the the same the answer is no. The same, <laughs> the same experts that are no. doing uh, common core. No. The same no, experts. No, 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 the same, no. You're asking the questions. I'm answering okay. the same questions about. No, uh, I'm talking about dyslexia research facilities because we still have a group of kids that the state of Texas say have a civil right to learn to read, and every. Everything. Actually, this is this is the best part about the process yeah. is the, the special education students. I don't need a special education not, student. She's, just, hold she's on. two years behind. Hold on. Okay. okay. I'm not worried. I'm answering the question for I'm the trying. people here. If you want to talk about your circumstance, you can yeah. come to my office anytime where you can talk about how it applies specifically. If you want to talk about dyslexia students, autistic students, any type of education that differs from the norm, a lot of these specialty schools are going to pop up that cater to these particular needs because there's going to be an economic benefit for those schools to specialize in the area. And you can choose to go to that school. Okay. Okay, um, we are out of time, so I'm going to give you both like 10 seconds to spit your question out and only one of you is going to answer it, okay? Okay. Uh, glad to see you guys on the other side. Thank you for winning. That's your 10 seconds. Uh, no, 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 no. <laughs> Stephanie, CDB Royal, uh, how process going on there? Right now, there are rules that are before the uh, DPS Commission. Uh, the rules that were put in place are not ones I support. They have taken the licensing fees from $6,000 to $1.3 million. <laughs> Uh, as long you know, as well as a whole bunch of other regulations, the commission will meet in December. Uh, several of us are going to submit comments to the uh, register uh, on the rules that they proposed. Uh, this this is not uh, what we uh, envisioned on the bill. Okay, last one. My question is really my question is for you. I apologize for speaking out of turn. Oh. Okay? And I guess I should rephrase my question. I like what you're doing. How do I do it? Uh. 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 Janet Easton, get in touch with this guy. Uh. Janet is still here? She's baby. Uh. Well, just come find me afterwards. Okay. So, 
Obviously, we have amazing representation in North Texas. Can you thank these people? So if y'all have further questions, these guys I know, guys and gal, I know would love to answer your questions, make an appointment with their office. Am I wrong in that? I mean, they've all offered that. So take advantage of it and y'all have a great night and a happy new year. Yeah. <laughs>